Right, um, good morning. My name is Ben Marshall and I'm here today to talk about CCTV cameras and systems, uh, particularly IP CCTV because we've had a fair few questions about it and it's always a useful topic to cover. Um, I would invite all of you who are here to pull out your smartphones, jump onto your app store, um, whether that's iOS or Android, and download the Goolink app and the MI app, M-E-Y-E. -E. By a guy by Tan Jian, I think is the guy who wrote this one. The idea is, I'm going to get you to log in and have a look at the camera setup that we do a bit later on. But after you've done that, after you've downloaded it, connect to my Wi-Fi network here. This is my little demo network for the day with my little local router. Okay. Alright. So, a bit of introduction first. My name is Ben Marshall. I've been working for Radio Parts for just over 10 years, in fact almost 11 years now. Um, for something I did when I was a kid, I must have irritated a witch and she's cursed me with the gift of technology, which means I've got a little bit of hands-on skill with most technical things, which seems to be the reason why they've got me up in front of you talking about cameras. Um, hopefully I know what I'm talking about, hopefully you can follow me along, but anything you've got I'll, as you go, just ask me a question and I'm happy to answer it. Uh, we are recording the session as well, so speak up if you do have a question so that we make sure we catch you on camera for it later on. Alright, everybody happy with that? Excellent. I'm going to get rid of this now. Ben's demo, password, radio parts. Alright, and that's the only slide. Best feeling is being able to close that down and not saving it. There we go. Yes, and it's failed. Good. Nice, that's a good start. Alright, so, let's switch over to the NDR. Alright, now how many of you have installed a, an IP camera system before? Or played with one yourselves? Guys on the floor have done a few of them. Reps, you've probably seen a few or worked around it. Any of the rest of you used an IP camera system before? No? Cool. Excellent. You're my target audience for this morning then. Um, the idea with an IP camera system is very, very similar to an analog system. In fact, all the interface is the same as for our analog DVRs. And our next generation of NVRs and DVRs, when they come, will also have this same interface and same structure. Okay. So that makes it really universal and simple for the next six months to a couple of years, however long we can keep getting these good products from this supplier. I'm going to teach you some of the little tips and tricks as we go through and the basic setup as we go along as well. But yes, please stop me if anything comes up that you need to know. So this is the start out interface for the NVR. I've just got this connected by HDMI out to the screen. That's it. Nothing particularly complicated there. When I log into this thing for the first time, I log in with username, admin, and the password. Can anybody tell me what that password is? Enter. Nothing. Absolutely zero. In the manual for this, it says the password is null, N-U-L-L. I think somebody in the factory went a little bit crazy with a thesaurus and decided to try and find out a more exciting word than blank to put in there. So there is no password by default. If you change that password, you need to go into the user admin, set it up, and change it here. And that will be your new password. If you do that and forget about it, you're in trouble. Because you can't log back in unless it comes back to our technicians here for them to reset it. It's for security reasons. There is no master code that we can give you that overrides anybody's password. It doesn't work that way, and you wouldn't want it to work that way. It's a very dangerous way to do things. So instead, for now, we're just going to go in by the default. And the very first time I log into these things, oh, by the way, I'm using the mouse for the interface. I hate the remote controls. Absolutely loathe them. Use the mouse whenever possible. Make your life easy. Our language for English, for this demo at least. And this is what it defaults to in terms of resolutions. Now, I'm going to change this for today because it's really hard to see anything on the screen when it's a 1080p. Okay? Change this to 1024 by 768 and yes, we can all read it now, which is quite nice. Uh, one cool feature is it does do a countdown. So if you change the resolution to something that your screen does not support, it will switch it back over within, I think, five seconds if you don't say yes I do want this resolution so if you've stuffed it up it'll hopefully come back right to where it was before 
Here is my default network ID and details. I can choose DHCP here, and you should always do that. Well, not always, but for now we're going to. Next, and we're done. That's the basic first time set up for this thing. And you'll notice that there was an option on there. If I go back in. To next time, don't show it. That's a good option to choose. Otherwise, every time you log into the menu, it will come up with the same stuff again. And this is it. So you've got playback menu, backup menu, and other things like that as you go through. The bits that we're going to be interested in are the settings, the IP channel settings for today at least. I've done a video on some of the other features and I will be doing video manuals for these things as well in the next couple of weeks to next month or so, I hope. Um, and the idea will be that each individual section will have its own little video to show you how to set up an IP camera, how to set up motion detection, how to set up user management, all those sorts of things. I don't have enough time to go through them all today with you, okay? But for today, I'm going to start with how do we actually get the cameras up and running. And to do that, I need to talk to you a little bit about IP addresses, okay? Now, is this a term that you guys have heard before? Who knows what an IP address, well, who's heard of an IP address before? All of you? Yeah? All right, can anybody, well, no one. It's not something that's uh, easy to understand in itself, so let me give you the best way I know of to think about it. This is an IP address here, 192.168.0.122. Right, that's what it's sitting on at the moment. I think of this in four different sections as it's written here. The 192 is the state that you live in, let's say. So that's 192, say, for Victoria. 168 is like the city that you, or the uh, or the suburb, let's put it as a suburb that you live in, so West Melbourne for us. The next one along, the zero in this case, let's say it's 562 Spencer Street. It's our street address here. It could be 562 Spencer Street at 1, it could be 566 at 2, and so on and so on, or it could be anywhere you want to. And the last number is the apartment number within that address. So you think you've got all these apartment buildings up and along the street. If I'm in an apartment building, I can walk up and down to any of the other apartment numbers. So I can go from 0.1 to 2 to 3 to 5 to 15 to 127, it doesn't matter, they're all in the same apartment building. But if I want to go to 1.27 from 0.27, I have to go outside, up the street, and then up through the next building to go to that apartment number. Does that make sense? Is a rough idea? It's the same thing here. Things that are within the same subnet, apartment building or street address, can see each other really easily. Things that are next door, well, they don't have any windows. You can't see out the window and see what you need over there. You need to actually go out there and go to it. What this means is that on a network, you need to be very careful about where you put these things because there are only so many spaces on a network and they can't all talk to each other if, they don't, you know, if they're not on the same street address. Does that make sense? By default, this thing comes out with 192.168.1.188. But by choosing DHCP, my modem, my gateway, has already given it an address that it knows how to deal with. So it knows what a 0.122 address is, because if I change it, well, there's my default gateway, which is my address for the router. Because that's set to 0.1, it doesn't want to deal with something that's next door, it wants to put it in the same range. So it has. And so it's put it at 122 because that's a currently free port on my network. So if I go across to my computer and go across to my router, modem, whatever it is, this is my device. Now, uh, there are a couple of ways to find this, by the way. Um, if you, uh, so here's your basic, you know, interface for your network, I'm oh, sorry, for your devices. If I go into my network, here's my wireless router, I can right click on that and view device web page, and bang, up comes my, my little modem. That's pretty easy. The other way to do it, if you're old school like me, is bring up the command prompt, and in here, 
you'll see there is my default gateway. There is my DHCP server, same place. And there's my local IP address. So that's what this computer is on, on that network, on that device. Does that make sense? I doubt that you're ever going to have to do that, but if you're running older versions of Windows, it's probably the simplest and quickest way to find it. Um, Windows 7 and Windows 8, you can right click and bring up the thing, and probably on Windows 10 as well, although I haven't got that yet. Um, if I go in here, you can see my network tab, my LAN settings, there is my IP address for this device. If I go across to my DHCP settings and my clients list, I've got devices here that are all connected to my uh, router. And you can see down the bottom here, 192.168.0.122. And that is that same IP address that that DVR had a couple of minutes ago. So, this DVR exists on this network and this router knows where it is. It's that simple. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, I'm going to jump you across to another tool that might help you out. On the disk that comes with the motor, oh, sorry, with the NVRs and the DVRs, we put a whole heap of different little tools and manuals and things like that on that little disk. They're also on our website. You can download them for free and view them and use these bits of software to run it. So I've got one here. It's actually already running it, but I'll close it down for this. In the tool section here on the IP search tool, there's this little device manager. If I run this, uh, oops, did I, am I already running it? It's working perfectly before and now I've broken it, haven't I? There we go. So here is my, my little IP discovery tool. I can choose whether I want to look for IP cameras and NVRs. I can discover, and bang, there we go. There are my cameras, one, two, and my NVR underneath it there. It hasn't found any of your phones or tablets or any other devices, it's just found the gear that it's looking for. And you can see, there's my NVR, there's camera number one, camera number two, they've got their own unique serial numbers, MAC addresses, and local IP addresses. Oh no, we've got a problem. Guess what? These things all come out of the box with the same default IP address. 192.168.1.188. It's not at 562 Spencer Street, it's 564. It's in the wrong network, it's not where it's supposed to be, so you can't see these cameras properly right now. They're there, they're plugged in, but they're also trying to talk at the same time in the same apartment building. And, you know, anybody who's lived closely with somebody else will tell you that two people trying to talk over each other in the same apartment building can get quite messy. It's the same thing here. So, we can change these from this tool. I can select my NBR and down the bottom of the screen here I can manually adjust the IP addresses and the gateway address really simply. I can go into these cameras. You can see they're defaulted out to where they were. I can turn those on to the same gateway and I can adjust it here. So if you know what you're doing with networks, this is a really quick way to get it set up and done. But you need to know where all these other devices are on your network to make sure you don't try and do the same address or the same apartment building or the same you know, apartment that the rest of these things are on. I'm stretching the analogy quite a long way here, but you get my point. You need to know that these things are in free space. So the cameras can't use DHCP? They can. They can? Yeah, definitely can. I haven't got them set up for that right now, but yes, they definitely can. So. In this, this is the way to manually set it. Now, who knows what DHCP is? Yeah? Yeah? Music, can you give me a description for it, or how it works? It's dynamic host control protocol, yep. and it's where the device requests the address from the browser. Exactly. So, this thing's got <coughs> brain, the modem or the router's got brains in it to tell people where to go in the apartment building. You know, it tells them which apartment they're living in. You rock up to the front, you know, the front desk and say, which apartment am I in today? And bang, it assigns you to it. So every single one of you, when you connected to my Wi-Fi network, you didn't have to put in a manual IP address. My router said, go here, go here, and your phones did it automatically. All right? 
You can do the same thing with the DVR, which is why it has pulled up this gateway address and it's pulled up its own IP address there. If you've got DHCP switched on in the cameras and you've got the right gateway address there, in other words, it knows so that the cameras know where to get their DHCP information from, you can do that too. So if I go in here and change this to 0.1, modify it, I go to this one here and change my gateway address to 0.1, whoops, that wasn't what I wanted to do. Thing. You can see my MVRs come up, I choose the cameras, I just go to the cameras, and I didn't change it properly. And you can see that it wouldn't let me do it for this one because I think I've got the HCP switched off in this particular camera. So look, make sure. Yeah. So this one's not letting me do it because I've actually got DHCP switched off. So it's not, it's trying to do the wrong thing here. Um, I did that deliberately because I was playing around with these earlier with the first crew. So, Alright, on this list here I can still play around and change those local IP addresses and change these to a fixed range that suits what I'm doing here and that fits in with every other device that's on my network and doesn't cause conflicts or cause problems. So it's an easy way to set them if you know your way around a network and you know what's in there and where it all is. Um, yeah, it, it's pretty simple if you do it that way. Yeah, go for it. Just a question on changing the address menu on the camera. We tried this yesterday, right, and changed the 188 to a 101 on the minus board. Not me, but uh, yeah. Uh, so someone here. Uh, and then we connect the camera up to that blind, right, and we connect it back to the screen. Yeah. It actually defaulted back to 188 again. Sure. So we brought the camera back in, we're not sure what's wrong with it. The other three cameras look yeah. fine. You yeah. manually change the address, but not that one camera. All right. Is there a particular reason you might have come across as to why? <coughs> Is it a faulty camera? Not necessarily. Uh, what my guess would be is that the tool isn't actually the tool is trying to do is trying to de push information out to the camera. But if the camera is locked out, you can see what I'm doing here. It's not letting me change it. Not letting me change that information. It, it, no, it actually it does allow me to change it. Because yeah. when I hit on here, discover, it's... it actually shows me the correct address that I change it to. Okay. As soon as I take it out, I hook it back to the unit. Ah, okay. The screen goes blank, then I go, what's going on? Put it back in, and I see the address yeah. before cap. Have you got, uh, it depends where you've got DHCP switched on in that case. Was it on in the camera and the NVR and in your router? I couldn't get into the camera via straight cable into the laptop. Uh, you, did you change the IP address on your laptop to do that? Uh, no. Okay. Because that, that's the number one thing that causes problem there. So this is a this is a bit of an odd thing and probably something most of you won't come across very often. But if you go to uh, let's have a look here. If you want to connect directly to any of these devices, you need to make your laptop be on the same subnet and the same network as the rest of the stuff. To do that. Doing it automatically doesn't really work. Um, if I go into, I'm trying to remember where it is. Uh, no, that's not it. Um, basically, under your there's a quicker way to do this, but I can't remember what it is now. But um, in under here, there's an IPv4 setting. Go into your properties here and it's automatically trying to grab an IP address and the rest from here. If you want to connect to this camera on its own, you'd have to create a uh, 1. I don't know, 101, somewhere on that same uh, subnet and same network as the camera itself. If I've got this thing plugged directly into something that doesn't have DHCP and isn't assigning automatic IP addresses and all that sort of stuff. I don't want to do that here because it will knock me out everything else that's going on. But choosing that and doing that manually means you can connect to the NVR without a network. You can connect to the cameras, providing you have a PoE injector, a switch, or something like that in there as well. And then configure the exact interface for it. Get into their web page and all that other stuff. If you need to, you can get in directly by doing it this way. 
So possibly what was happening is the tool wasn't actually pushing information out properly and it wasn't staying or it wasn't sticking in there. Um, going onto their individual camera web page, going into the login information and having a look from there might have helped for that one. Or using the video monitor tool to do the same thing, which sort of brings me up to my next toy I was going to show you, or next program. So, I've, yeah, I'm still online. Beautiful. So, at the moment I've got my top one on our network, the other two devices are not. I'm just going to go across to another bit of software that's on this disk. It's called the Video Monitor Client. Video Monitor Software, there it is. All right, no password as well for automatic, oh, sorry, for the default. And here's my content management software, in other words, our viewer. So if you're running this on the local network, you can view all your cameras and devices via this interface, which is uh, neat and nifty if you've got somebody whose permanent job it is to, to view these things. They don't have to be physically connected to the NVR, they just have to be on the same network. So put this thing in the shed, put it in the factory, put it in a data rack somewhere out of the way. No screen directly off it, just connected via the network and then you can view the cameras and do other things like that. It makes it fantastic for secure environments and things like that. If I go across to my configuration, go to CMS, right click to add a device and search. And there are my three devices that have come up on the network. All right, so I've got the NVR at the top. I've got camera one and camera two in there. Select them all. I can batch add them. And uh-oh, because they're on the same IP address, they're not going to work properly. And that's something I can't get around with this software. It won't let me play with it. I can leave it from here. There's my NVR. I go into my NVR page, it shows me I've got four cameras potentially connected, but there's nothing connected to them right now because it doesn't know there's a camera there. I can go and choose this one, or I can put my camera number four over here and you know, do it in whatever configuration you want. Down the bottom, you've got the different types of screen configuration you want, so if you want one big one and so on. The software is quite useful that way. Um, you can TV wall it and a few other things. You can also do local playback, so you can search through the you know, footage that's on there and view it on this computer as well. So you don't actually have to be physically connected to the NVR or DVR. <coughs> the same interface is here for the DVR as it is for the IP uh, NVRs. I can in here, if I select this, do remote config, I can bring up all the internal settings for this device without having to connect to it directly again. So I can go into my device information page, I can go into my network information page, I can see that I've got DHCP set up, I've got the gateway correct. I can go into my channel parameter and change the video configuration, I can, whatever else. I can do all the same things I can do on the DVR I can do here, which is kind of cool. Um, again, it means you don't have to be directly connected to it. <coughs> the other way that you can do all of this is via Internet Explorer. So, because these units use ActiveX controls to program them and use them and uh, use the interface, the only browser that they work with natively is Internet Explorer. I've heard <coughs> that you can get some plugins for Chrome and other devices that allow you to get ActiveX controls running in other browsers, but it's not that good. It's not how it's, uh, yeah, it's not native. So Internet Explorer is definitely preferred for it. When you go onto this page for the first time, unfortunately I've already done this this morning, so it's gone past the step. There will be up in this top hand corner, a button or a text that says install ActiveX control. You need to install that ActiveX control the first time you use it. It's like a driver for this web page. It's a thing that runs in the background that allows you to interface and connect and do everything else up to do it. To get to that, occasionally you will need to go into your internet options and into security. We've put all these steps up on the website, by the way, so don't worry that I'm going through this fast. But if you go into your custom level, into the ActiveX areas, and go down to download unsigned ActiveX controls, change that from disable to prompt, initialize, change it from disable to prompt, then you should be good to go. And so what will then happen is it will let you download and install the driver, or the ActiveX control. And isn't that the same 
pop up. No, it's different this one. This is this is letting us run it now that I'm actually on the web page. So you have to enable it to be able it to install in the first place. Once you've installed it, you come back to the page and then it says, do you want to run this thing? The reason for this is Microsoft runs a certification process for these, trying to work out what programs are dodgy, what extensions are dodgy, and which ones are good. It costs a lot of money, generally, to get one of these things approved. And when we've got different generations of DVRs and MVRs that might change one tiny little thing about the driver, every time you go to a different generation of MVR, we have to get another approval for the next software, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and it starts becoming a pretty expensive process. If this is a site that you recognize, which it is, and it's a program that you recognize, which it is, then you can allow it safely, and it won't cause you any harm on your computer. So I allow that. Again, no password. I don't know what that non-ActiveX is yet. I haven't used it, but I'm going to have give it a go a bit later on. And I log into it. And this is my MVR. So I've got a web interface. So I've got a local interface if I've got a screen plugged into it. I've got the video monitor software on my computer if I've got a network interface for it. And I've got this as another network interface for it as well. I don't have to run a particular bit of software, I just have to run the browser. So any one of those does more or less the same thing. So you've got less options in terms of how your screens are viewed and a few less options in how you know, the functions and controls work, but if I go to configuration, you'll see I'm in the same thing that I was in before and I've got full control over everything that the NVR has. I've got motion detection settings I can play with, I can change the IP addresses, I can change the video settings and everything via the web interface. So I've got three completely different ways to do the same job. Depending on your customers and your job site, one of these three or two of these three, or all three of these might be necessary. Okay, So we give you the option for it. Uh, right, so let's get out of that. So I want to go back over to the NVR, because I want to get these cameras up and running. So back across to this, get out of here. All right, so here is my IP channel settings. So this is a way to do it manually. There's an automatic way to do it. Let's try the auto way and see what happens. So what this is doing is it should be searching through your entire network for anything that looks like an IP camera that it recognizes in some sort of format that it recognizes. And once it's done that, it should be able to pop them up on the screen here and have them set up for you. Now, I did default this before, so it should be back to the basics for it. We'll see how we go. Cool. That was pretty easy. So these things were on the same IP address. One had a one gateway address, another one had a different gateway address, and yet here they are. It's because the tool is supposed to search through it all and find them wherever they are on your network. Okay? So it's relatively simple when it works that way. It's possible that it may not, in which case you can go into your IP channel setting to man uh, to do manual, then you bring up this interface instead. And so in here, it will search and find these devices on the network. And you can see that they've been assigned 0 0.2 and 0 0.3 IP addresses. So if I go over to, back to my computer, to the camera's web page. And so I can log into the camera and do its settings individually. Um, there's the ActiveX control on the top that I was talking about before. You can click that to download it and install it. So instead, we've already got it installed, so we just have to do this. And if I log in here, I have got, when it loads, the camera, that's the one up on the top here. And I can go to the substream or the mainstream for it, and there are different formats and resolutions depending on which one you're viewing. Yeah, that may save you some network load, which I will get into a bit later on. All right, so go into configuration for this one, and you can see the camera's got its own configuration and menu structure as well. So there are options you can set for this camera. 
specifically. If I go into it's channel parameters, then video parameters. Beautiful. This is what I was looking for. I can see my day and night modes are in here. So I can set what level of day it comes on for and what level of night it comes on for. So depending on your environment, you may not want the infrareds to come on at all. But you can set it in here to make that happen. If you want to switch the infrareds on faster or slower, you can also do that all through this interface here. There's nothing on the camera itself, there's no buttons, there's nothing to press, but this is all built in as part of the interface. It allows you to customise it specifically for your job. In the advanced settings here, you can play around with some of these. I can change my mirroring that I did earlier on and save it. And now it's back up the right way again, so my hand is where it needs to be. I can change my wide dynamic range on it. So I can change whether it works really, really well in wide dynamic range or I can turn it off if I'm getting a weird artifact or some video problem that I'm not expecting. And that's as simple as changing it there and then hitting save down the bottom. Does that make sense? It's pretty cool that you can do all of that via the web interface for it. You don't have to even be on, you know, you have to be on the same network as this thing to make it happen, for now at least. But easy to set and change. And if you set a username and password for your cameras, you can stop anybody else from getting in there to change those settings after you're done. It's well worth doing. All right, um, you, in my network settings here, you can see I've got DHCP switched on, which is why it's been given a 192.168.0.2 address. And my gateway address there is correct, so it knows where to sit on the network. If I go across to TP-Link, you can see, uh, it's got my phone, I think, trying to connect to the same IP address at the moment. Which probably means my phone's going to crack it in a minute. Go back over to my clients list. Yeah, okay. It's not actually showing me the correct data for it. Anyway, my it's coming up here and yeah, so there's my NVR, there's one of my cameras here and there's another one up further as well so yes it's dumped it where it wants to on the network for it and in here it's zero and two. All right. Cool so that's the web interface for the camera itself. I'm going to log out of that now. You don't, write, don't need it straight away. Shut that down. <coughs> if I go back into the video software. I can add devices, search. There are my two cameras. And those. Actually, you can only do it one at a time. We need the batch add, which is not what I did. Do that. Select. You can put username and password in there if you need to, and oops, wrong one. Let's try number two. So it should stop you from doing silly things, but there they are. I still do them anyway. Go into my preview and look, there's my system. I can get rid of that because I don't care what it is. I can go in here and choose channel two. And so I've now got my other camera which is on the seat there running. Now I can see my cameras very easily via this interface. I can also look view the individual cameras. So if you don't have an NVR on your network you can still view the cameras. That could be useful. The other reason I like this sort of layout is you can choose individual cameras to view and show up on the screen without having to have all of them up there. So if you've got a business with a camera over the cash register and one over the back, del the delivery gate at the back, you may not want those viewable on the screens out in the store. So this allows you to choose which ones of those you actually want to view. On the NVR you can do some of that and choose which ones you want as well, but it's not as easy to do as it is just to bring this up and show these things on their own. And that's where a lot of this other stuff comes in as well. All right, so our playback options. I can go into my NVR, I can choose a couple of cameras, 
choose a date, let's choose yesterday because I actually did something yesterday. Video search and bang, there are my dates at the bottom there. Oh sorry, there's my times. I go from 0, 100 hours through to 23, well, 23.59 and I've got blue sections for standard recording and I've got a couple of yellow sections which are motion detection recordings from yesterday. I double click on it and I bring it up and there's our advertising guy having a chat to me in the boardroom while I was setting these things up. And that's a motion detection event that's gone off and recorded while the motion was going and then stopped once we were done. All right. And it's upside down because the cameras have been upside down every time I've played with them so far. So, sorry about that. Um, yeah, pretty simple, huh? Alright. So, let's go into a bit of these settings for these things and play around with that. Now, are you all happy with that and how that's gone so far? Any questions or anything you need to bring up with me while I'm going past? No. So if you so if you want to connect to the camera or connect to the NDR, you can do it direct okay. without, a, without a network as long as you change that and then set you Yeah, you to can do, to do the settings and all Yeah. So you can connect directly to any of these devices. Keep in mind with the cameras they need POE. So yeah. plugging them into your laptop's not gonna work. No. But plugging them in via a little POE dumb switch, for example, will work. Yeah. Um, like one of the little 80 Max 8 ports that we do. Yeah. Plug your laptop into one of the ports, plug this thing into one of the other PoE ports. Don't connect it to any router or a DHCP server or anything else like that. Just have them sitting alone on a desktop there and you can configure them without having to do anything else. But you do need to change your IP settings for your laptop so they can talk with each other. Okay. Does it have to be the PoE or can you use the 12-port on the you should be able, yeah, you'd be able to use the 12 volt direct input too. Good point, Eric. Um, these cameras, it won't be on the video because it can't see from there, but we've got a direct 12 volt DC input as well as a tri uh, test output, which is just standard composite video. So you can plug your old meter into that one and view it, or plug it into a TV screen of some kind to see what's going on. So if you've got this thing up on the side of a wall somewhere, you've got your little you know, test monitor on your wrist. Plug in the voltage from the test monitor and the video input from your test monitor and you can see the test set, the angle, the zoom and everything else like that locally before you plug it into the network and go through all the rest of this stuff. So you can do it while you're up on the scissor lift or while you're up on the ladder without having to go down inside, have a look at it. No, it's not good enough, go back out, go up to the camera, adjust the angle, go back down again and off you go. So, cool, good points, thank you very much. Alright, so I'm in the, uh, the settings for the NVR and I'm going to do talk about motion detection on here. This is a question we get asked all the time and here's where we start. On the first video I did it through the web interface. I can also do exactly the same thing through the NVR's direct interface on HDMI and I'll show you that in a minute how the two are mirrored against each other. Okay, But for here I've got camera one Camera two, camera three, and camera four. And the reason they are all separated is you do not necessarily want to have the same settings on every single camera in your building or in your job site. That simple. I've got enable recording on all cameras, I've got all day recording, and I've got recording type schedule recording. Well, I don't want that, I want motion. And it changes the color to make it nice and friendly to show you what they've actually done. I can pre-record, which I always recommend because motion detection is triggered when something changes on the display. If something moves really, really fast, you might already be halfway through the frame before the motion detection is actually triggered as a starting point. So think of somebody running past the front, you know, front of a shop, throwing a brick through it and then continuing on going. You might only catch them. The motion detection may only set off when they're a serious way into the frame already. Whereas if you set a pre-record, you've got five seconds or 10 seconds of pre-footage that will catch them coming in from the edge of frame or catch them moving really, really quickly through if you need to. Things like cars, that's really useful. People running, you know, quick hand movements like that, you might need some pre-record on there as well. Uh, you can put, also put a, uh, this is actually mislabeled here by the looks of it. It's actually a post-recording time. So, if you've got a motion detection set off, you can set the footage length after the motion detection is finished. 
So I wave my hand over here, then for the next five seconds, it records that as a chunk of video as well, okay? Pre-record, I always recommend. Post-record, it's kind of up to you. The motion detection is good, it shouldn't matter. But post-record is useful if you've got things that move very, very slowly. So if somebody's sort of standing in frame, just standing there looking at something, motion detection went off when they moved into frame, but while they're just standing there doing nothing, it's not going to happen. If they then sort of reach forward and grab something and it's kind of hidden from the camera, you're not going to see what goes on. So having a bit of post recording to catch that person if they're trying to do something sneaky or changing your camera angle will help. Okay. Um, let's have a look. Let's do that. We're going to copy it to all channels. And that means that if I go across to camera number three, yeah, I didn't do it properly because I didn't save it. There you go. It's the thing I always do. Um, you've noticed it's all gone to blue again. It's because I'm an idiot and I didn't do motion detection, copy to all channels, copy, and then save. Without saving, I haven't pushed that configuration across to the NVR or the DVR, so it doesn't know that I've done anything to it. And you can see if I go across to camera two, and I haven't done it right again, have I? this. Yeah. Okay, it's not pushing the information across properly. I don't know what I've done to mess that up right now. Okay. We move into the motion detection side for a second. We'll come back to that. Um, there are two different pages to do this kind of recording. There's the schedule recording page, and then there's the motion detection page. The schedule recording page is telling the NVR or the DVR that you want it to do some kind of recording of some type. That could be schedule, motion, triggered, fire, an external push button or a sensor or something like that. It gives you all those options, but you haven't actually told it to do anything other than look to do something at between these hours and these times. On the motion detection page, you start telling it what to actually do when that is triggered. So on here, we need to enable motion detection. We want to set our motion detection area, and that will be... Yeah, this isn't, this interface isn't working properly. Let's do it by the way. I don't know why, but I'm, it's not working properly at the moment. It could be because I'm playing around with too many different things at once. Uh, 0.122. Let's just log into that. Yeah, there we go. Right, log in. There we go. There's my system. Configuration, channel parameters, video parameters, and schedule report. Okay. So, channel one enabled. Which days of the week? Well, we're going to do it all days of the week. And we want motion. We can copy it to all week. We can add five seconds of pre record. Copy to all days. And save. Success. So if I now go across to channel 3, it also says motion. If I go across to Thursday, it hasn't copied the days of the week. So I'm going to get that right. Okay. Alright. Here's my motion detection page. Apologies, it worked perfectly when I was playing with it earlier, and now I've done ticked something, and I'm not sure what I've done to make it break. Uh, I'll have to find that again in a second. This is our motion detection settings for channel 1. This is for channel 2, and you can see the camera changes when you do it. Channel 3, there's nothing, and channel 4, there's nothing. If I go to channel 1, you'll notice it's not enabled. In other words, it's not actually doing any motion detection recording yet. So I need to enable that, number 1. I'm on Monday. I've got my period of time that I want it to motion detect for. I can copy that to all days of the week. So, theoretically, if I go to Wednesday, 
Friday, it's all the same now. And I've got the same motion detection, I've got the same area that's set, the same sensitivity for everything. Great, we're done, right? Anybody spots something that I haven't done? Not James, who's had this problem and asked it a million times. Not KU, who's had the same thing. Yeah, we haven't actually told it to record yet. We've told it to motion detection, which is great. It now knows that motion happened, but it doesn't know what to do once the motion's happened. We can do an alarm on monitor. In other words, something pops up on the screen to say motion's detected. I can do an audio warning, which means the NVR beeps at you whenever motion goes off. I can upload it to the center, which is the video monitor software's hard drive. So when motion goes off, it dumps a copy onto your computer as well as doing it here. I can email the linkage. Please be very careful with that one. Every time motion goes off, you get an email. How many people would like that? Um, I've had people that want it, they normally turn it off within about five minutes of activating it, so be very careful with that one. You also trigger the alarm outputs on here, which is you've got serial ports on the back here. Uh, sorry, not serial ports, you've got terminal strips on the back. You can plug them in to trigger an alarm system from the motion detection. Again, I wouldn't do this. You can also trigger a light to go on. So if camera one goes off, somebody walks through the beam, then your floodlights outside go on. You set up the right circuit and make that sort of thing happen. If somebody walks through a particular area or drive through a particular area, you could potentially use it to trigger a gate to release or something else along those lines. There are a lot of ways you could play with that if you want to. But what we're interested in even here is the recording down the bottom, yes, on the computer. There we go. So I haven't done anything with it yet. I'm on channel one. I trigger recording number one. I save it. And now it's doing motion detection recording on channel one. So I've told it the times and dates of the week. I've told it the area that I wanted to cover. And I've told it what to actually do when the motion detection goes off. Does that make sense? Yeah. Just yes. Quick, quick on, has anything changed with the sensitivity? I remember the last time you mentioned that. It's high, still hypersensitive, yeah. Um, the sensitivity is based on how many pixels in the, the display move or shift. And so sensitivity is a little bit overly sensitive in here. It goes from uh, one up to six or zero actually on close. I recommend leaving it on one 95% of the time. Two might be about the uh, four of the remaining, you know, another 4% of the time. I had exactly one guy who's taken it up to level 3 for what they needed it for, which was inside a darkened shipping container that was a storage container for food, and he wanted to pick up when rats moved around or mice moved around if they came into that um, shipping container. And because the environment was completely controlled, there was no extra external lights, there was no movement, there was no fluttering of air or anything else to cause it to go off. It's completely dead space. If so much as a cockroach moved on the floor, he tells me, and I'm not going to tell you where he is because cockroaches and food, yeah. Um, yeah, no. Um, the idea being, in that environment, it was perfect for what he wanted to do. I don't know anybody who's used a four, five, or six successfully. Um, at these sort of levels, you can see around the edge of this light here, if you went into full detail, there would be some pixels that flicker on and off. It's just light, dark, light, dark. They don't, you know, sort of that's the way the pixels are picking up in the camera. That would be enough to set off the motion at some of those higher levels. So you, it's pointless. You'd have 24 hour a day recording. The motion would be doing nothing at all. Okay. Um, I'm not, yeah, I can't see a lot of reason to take it beyond one. In most cases, that's enough to do what you want to do. I'd like scales below that, but we don't have it. So that's what we're working on. All right, so that's motion detection. Does that make sense? The last thing I'll make a point of is it looks complicated, yes. There are quite a few steps that you have to go through, absolutely. The reason for that is every single job you do, every single environment you go into, the solution needs to be different. Not everybody wants 24 hours a day, seven day a week motion detection across all cameras. In a business like this one, we would probably want 24 hour a day record, well, standard recording, throughout our business day here inside so we can see everything that goes on. But at night time, if we're recording all through here all the time, we're just wasting hard drive space. Outside, we might want it recording all the time, but in here, chances are nothing's gonna happen. So we've set motion detection from 
you know, 7 or 8 p.m. at night through till 6 a.m. the next day in these sort of zones and environments. And you can change that from this camera to the one over near reception, the one outside to that one over there, and every different day of the week. So Saturdays and Sundays, we're here Saturday 9 till 4. Again, you can set it up and do those sorts of things for it. Um, in other businesses, it could be completely different. And that's what makes you professional installers different from the guy that buys a kit off eBay or you know buys a $200 kit from the local big box store. <coughs> They'll be perfectly happy with 24 hour a day recording for two days and then the hard drive ticks over and ticks over and ticks over and ticks over until it dies. They might be able to set up basic motion detection 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But your job is to go in there and get the best solution for your customer and this gives you the capability to adjust what you need to to make it work. Okay? That makes sense? All right. Now, I'm trying to think what else I was going to cover. Oh yes, remote apps because we're getting to, we're running a bit late on time here. So, I'm going to ask you now to pull out your phones and we'll go back over to the DBR, NBR. All right, remote access is the other question I get asked all the time. So I'm going to show you two ways to do it. There's a quick and simple way and a more complicated way. Uh, the more complicated way you may need, but let's do the quick and easy one first. So, everybody open up the Goolink apps on their phone if you've got it, and make sure you're connected to my local network here, okay? So everybody on Ben's demo network? Beautiful. All right, so, stopping my voice recording. Move over to Goolink. And I'm going to Still mirroring. Should have switched it over. Cool. Once this comes up, this is my phone's interface. Now, I'm just going to delete the one that I was playing with for the first session because that's cheating. So, this is my phone's interface for Goolink. All of yours is going to look pretty similar. At the moment, there's nothing on here. There's no devices, nothing on the list. If I go to add a device, just by hitting the plus, there are three options for it. QR code, manual code, or a local search. The manual code is about a 20, is about a 20 digit code for that camera or for that DVR. You can find it in the DVR settings, you can find it through the web pages and other stuff like that for it. I don't recommend using it because typing 20 characters or more into your phone and changing the case and all that other stuff is painful. The two other ways are a QR code or a local search. Okay? I prefer local search. So if I'm on Wi-Fi, which I am with my system here, I can do a local search and I bring up three devices. That is my NVR and my two cameras. And you can see they're located by their GID, their ID numbers. If I bring up my little port thing here, you can see those numbers correspond more or less with those ones. So you've got 026, which is the bottom one, with 643 at the end, which is 026 with 643 at the end. So that's one of my cameras. 023, whatever it is, with 123C is the top one. That is my NVR. And this one's one of my other cameras. So if I choose my NVR, I go in and choose... And you guys can do all this for yourselves as well at the same time. And that's pretty much it. I've now got Goolink up and running. And you can see on my little demo icon there, I've got little blue lights on it. It's a bit easier to see on your phone. You tap that demo icon, tap the camera for the first time you're connecting to it, and then it's hooked up camera one. And there is camera two. I can flick them around, I can change the orientation, make it bigger, all that sort of thing. So that's it. That's Goolink set up. That's cool, but I'm on Wi-Fi with it. I'm local, right? Well, Goolink has this really cool feature in that it communicates via your modem, when it's connected to the internet, to an off-site service that works out all the port forwarding and all that other stuff like that for you, so you don't need to do it. So if I was connected to the internet, with this modem, I could flick off Wi-Fi on my phone, 
connect to 3G or 4G and still see it, still stream it. It can take about half an hour or so for that to update through the Goolink service to make that happen. So give it a little bit of time if it's the first time you're setting one of these things up. But really, that's it. That's Goolink, peer-to-peer -peer networking, remote access set up and done. Sorry Ben, sorry, just move that on demo one. Yep. And, uh, like we'll search, pick your device. Mm -hmm. You just call it demo. Yep. What do you use? Just put a user and password, because might just get over the same password error. Yep, so admin and no password. Uh, so the just same as the login. Yeah. 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 I went a bit fast past that, sorry. Yes, uh, you do need to put admin for the username and password is null, blank, nothing, zero, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's the same as it is for to log into the NBR locally or via the interface or whatever else you want to do. Um, now, has anybody come up with the maximum number of users error or we haven't got as many in, as in the first session? No, cool. There are only so many channels you can run, uh, viewers you can run simultaneously. Um, but that's it, that's Googling set up and done. Now, with that, why did I then say there was a complicated way of setting it up? Well, it's for a pretty simple reason. Not every modem or router lets you do this. Particularly one from big ISPs don't let you do this. They lock down their modems and routers with custom firmware and hardware options and the rest so that you don't break things, like the average user doesn't break things. The problem is, as custom installers and specialists, your job is to kind of do things that are outside the norm. So you can uh, talk to whoever the service provider is and get them to open it. It can be painful. You can replace their Wi-Fi router with a better one. So you give them better Wi-Fi, you know, give them a better router and a better modem than the default one they come with anyway. Or, if none of that is an option, and a lot of corporate networks are the same way, they're locked down to not allow this peer-to-peer -peer stuff work, then you can do this differently. So I'm going to get out of the Goolink app, get rid of that, I'm going to go back over and I'm going to open up the second one, which is MI. Now again, I'm cheating because I've already got the original one up, so let's stop that from working. It wouldn't have worked because it was the old IP address that I set earlier for it. So this is MI. Yes, of course it failed to connect because there's nothing connected to it. I can also use MI to connect to this device. Now MI is an app that works locally within Wi-Fi or if you do port forwarding and the rest you can access it remotely as well. But it means you need to get into your modem or router and set up a port forwarding to do that. Okay. So in this case, let's add it as a device. You're all on Wi-Fi, let's add it locally. We go to our home, go to our device list, we add a new device. Now the address is the address we've got from here. So it's 192.168.0.122. 192.168.0.122. See that there, a port number. Now, this is the tricky bit when it comes to MI. If I have a look here, I can see my control port is 5050. If I put that port number in there, let's try it. Well, you guys don't. I'm going to do it just for now. And what was going on? Actually, it's died. What had happened there? It might be, I've got a custom keyboard running on here and that tends to break things quite a lot. Uh, port 5050, username admin. Alright, so there's my device. Go back here, go to here, go to my live view. It's buffering, looks good. Yeah, it's taken a bit too long. And it's because it doesn't work. If you put that same port number in, it will not work. And eventually this will come up with an error that says failed or incorrect data or something like along those lines. So I've, yeah, it keeps trying to do it, but that's no good. I'm going to stop it, I'm going to delete that. I'm going to go into my device list into here, and I'm going to change this port number to 5053. Right? 5053. Now the reason for that is on a PDF that comes with, on the disk, 
and is on our website as well. So, enter into App Store and search for MI on the second page. Open MI, add device information, pay more attention to port information. The port should plus three. Ignoring the badly translated language there, what it means is if the device port is 5050, the port number you need is 5053. So, I switch across to my device, I do 5053, and I doing what I've done, I've managed to delete my screens again. Yeah, I think it's my custom keyboard it's causing me grief there. Go back in, go to my device list, go to this one, I go to here, change that to 5053, save up the top, go back to here, go to my live view, add device channel 1, and bang, there she is. Alright, it's that simple. It shouldn't buffer for that long, not unless you're even off. if you're out in the wild somewhere and the connection's bad, maybe it will. You can do that for yourselves. So 192.168.0.122 is the information. I'll go back to my device list. There it is. Port 5053, username admin, and nothing for the password. Simple enough, right? But remember that. If you change the port number, which you might need to do, if you put in port 9090 for your control port, you need to change to 9093 to allow this to happen. All right. And the last thing with this is, this is locally. I'm on the same network locally as this one is. If I move off-site, that, that IP address won't work. And that's when I need to use a dynamic DNS or a no IP service or something like that to locate here. Or I use the static IP address for my business. And whatever that is, put that address in there. And you'll need to get into your modem or router and set up port forwarding to make that happen. And I'm not going to show you how to do all that today because it's different for every different modem and router and I also don't have enough time. But you'll need to port forward that range, 5050 through to 5053 in here. Give your dying DNS of your no IP address details or your static IP address details and bang, that MI app will work wherever you are in the world at any time you like. Just so long as you're connected to the internet, you can view it remotely. It also means you can log in via the Internet Explorer webpage to view it remotely wherever you are in the world as well, just using that no IP, Dyn DNS, or your static IP address. Okay. Any questions about that stuff, come and see me afterwards because it's a bit more complicated than we've really got time to go into for now. All right. Um, so that's the remote access for it. The things you need to be careful of with remote access Anybody spot one of the biggest ones? If you're viewing cameras remotely? Bandwidth. bandwidth. Biggest, biggest thing is bandwidth. Say you're on an ADSL connection at your home, you've got these cameras set up. You've got 24 megabits worth of download speed. Fantastic. Your upload is not 24 megabits per second. It might be one or two megabits per second. If you're on cable, it could be higher. If you're on NBN, it could be higher again. But you've still got a limited amount of upload data that you can push through. If you start running heaps of these cameras and trying to view them remotely from 50 people that are all around, the, well, 10 people who are all around the world doing the app, you'll saturate your upload. And what happens when that happens is your local download speeds either drop like a stone or you won't be able to view the cameras remotely at all. So you've got to be a little bit careful about the type of plan that you're running and how much is going through it. And the other problem with that is you're generally on meter downloads, you know, you've got a 500 gig per month plan or a 50 gig per month plan. You've also got a certain amount of upload data that you can use too. And it's often not counted in the same breath as the download data. You might have 500 gig down, but you might only have 50 gig of upload data. Sounds a bit pessimistic, but in some cases that might be true. And if you're viewing this thing remotely from your business while you're sitting on a beach somewhere for 12 hours a day or 16 hours a day, you might actually come up with overage charges for, or shape data charges or something else for your account. It could be a dangerous thing, so be very, very careful what you're doing when it comes to video and data. The other side of it is bandwidth in the internal network too. So we're running these things on my little modem and router here. Okay, Not much to it. I'm only running these devices on it. We're not running the outside world. That's all there is. But if I have... 50 computers around radio parts on that network. And I've got 20 streams of 
1080p data running through the same network at the same time, I can end up with some problems because that's a lot of data all trying to use the same network at the same time. There are software and network side fixes for that, but they're well and truly beyond what we do here. In fact, you need a good network tech or engineer to really understand how all that stuff works. So my best advice to you is, if you come across a complicated network, talk to whoever their IT guy is. Make him your best friend. In general, it is a him, although there are some women out there doing it, but make him your best ally, your best friend on that job. Because so long as you're all talking together and he knows what you're doing and how your stuff is going to affect his stuff, then you'll stay friends forever. But if things go wrong, or you just dump all your stuff onto his network and then cause him problems, he will make your life very, very difficult. Never cross a sysadmin or a network engineer. They can really, really make your life difficult. So be friends, talk to your local IT guys, get their support, and they'll be able to help you out, OK? Um, and that's particularly true when it comes to IP cameras, just because the sheer amount of data that they're pushing through your network. 1080p via you know, 25 cameras simultaneously, nasty. Um, right, OK. Last few things, there'll be a bit some pieces I'm going to cover here, but sort of a uh, quick or a bit more rapid fire. PoE, IP cameras run on power over Ethernet in general. Our four and eight channel NVRs have got the capability to run those cameras and all of our cameras off it simultaneously. Just plug the data cable into the back to the PoE hub that's built into it, you're good to go. If you buy a 16 channel unit though, no PoE hub built in. Or a 25 channel, no PoE hub built in. You'll need to supply, or will need to supply you, external PoE switches to make that work. Okay? We've got some good options from Edimax already, and we'll have some bigger ones coming soon for 16s and 25s, and so on and so on and so on. But for now, at least, just keep in mind that if you go beyond the standard 8, you might need extra hardware to make it work. As a rough rule of thumb, these things run at about 6 to 8, maybe 10 watts maximum on PoE. If you've got 20 cameras, that's potentially 200 watts worth of PoE that you need. So if you've got two, you know, three 8 quart switches and they're all only capable of supplying 50 watts, 50 watts, 50 watts, 50 watts, 150, and you've got 200 watts worth of load, she's not going to work. So make sure you keep that in mind when you're designing these systems as well. Um, that's PoE. Other stuff. Uh, the next generation of cameras is coming to radio parts and the next generation of DVRs and NVRs is following behind them as well. So we're looking at replacing all of our analog cameras, all of our 700 line or 960H cameras with analog high def or AHD cameras. They give you 1080p worth of analog viewing through a single bit of coax with some power. That's RG59, that's RG6, depending on the length and everything else that you're running for. So you can retrofit old systems with AHD cameras and get 1080p clarity just for the new camera and the new DVR or NVR to match. You can also mix and match systems. So you've got analog 700 lines, an old D1 576 camera and an AHD all on the same system and record at different resolutions and different specs for what you're trying to do. So all of our cameras are moving across to that. Uh, there is an argument to be made for a couple of the main, there are other formats of high def cameras. Uh, TVI and CVI I think are two of the most common ones. They're incredibly proprietary and you can only run a TVI system with a TVI system, a CVI with a CVI and so on. And locking down to one particular supplier means that you can't retrofit and use old cameras or do other things like that. It makes a mess of it all. And our manufacturers have said we want the most open standards possible so that no matter what happens, we can use you know, all the generic cameras to make it happen. And AHD is an open standard. So we're pretty happy about that. Um, means we've got good reliability and good simplicity for people to make it work. Um, in that range, we are getting mini domes and normal domes, uh, wide domes and dome 30 equivalents as well. For any of you who use the old dome 30 analog cameras, there will be versions of that in the AHD range. So 1080p with a new lens that takes you from 2.8 to 12 millimeters. So wider where it needs to be wider and narrower where it needs to be narrower as well. 
all built into that little eyeball shaped camera that we've had for a very long time. We're also getting those cameras in an IP version too. So you have the analog high def and the IP versions looking almost the same but with an Ethernet PoE interface versus direct power and coax. Uh, there will be uh, outdoor cameras, uh, body cameras and other things like that to suit it as well. All with new lenses, 2.8 to 12 is pretty much the standard across most of the range, so giving you a lot of compatibility with it. We're getting in some more NVRs in our next shipment, and we're also getting in some new hybrid DVR, NVR, multi things. So what they mean is that if you've got an old system with a lot of old cameras, plug it into this new hybrid, no problem. If you've got some 700 lines and 576s, no worries, mix and match them, put them all in, great. If you've got some new AHD cameras, one or two, just where you need them, they'll also work with this system. So you can mix and match those, nice. They also work with IP cameras. So you can have a couple of IP cameras, a couple of AHDs, a couple of analog, old school cameras, all in the one system, and it works perfectly well. Very cool way of doing things. There are a couple of restrictions on them. The biggest one is that, depending on the resolution for recording you choose, the frame rates may drop. So, you know, 12 and a half, 13 frames per second rather than 25 frames or bigger. That's probably not an issue for a lot of people, but it might be something for your customers. The NVRs are still running at 1080p, 25 frames, all channels simultaneously. It's the way they're supposed to. So if you're really looking for the utmost performance, the NVRs are the way to go. But if you're dealing with legacy gear and you want to play with analog high def and other things, the hybrids would be fantastic for you. Okay. Pretty good. Um, did I have anything else I was going to show on here? I don't think I did. All right. Um, all right, that's pretty... I've spent a lot of time with you all now, but I've still got a few more minutes left for questions and things like that. If you've got anything I didn't cover, or if something was unclear, or I've missed something, please let me know. Yeah, rough approximately, yeah, rough approximately distances you can run AHDs? Ah, uh, no, just with the, with the IP stuff as well. Uh, it, the Cat 5 and Cat 6 side, you can generally run 100 metres plus. I think PoE is limited to 100 metres. PoE is limited though. Um, okay. However, you can also locally power them. So if you're using a 12 volt input out in the shed, you can push that further. I'm not sure the exact numbers, but at least 150 metres and more. Yeah. Theoretically, if you boost it and put switches in and other things, you could run 300 metres or more on that link if you have to. Um, generally speaking, when you get up to those sort of levels, you're better off putting wire, you know, data links and other network stuff in there to make it work better and fibre and so on. And you also saw before that we've got delays in what's being viewed. The worse, the, the bigger the network is, the bigger the runs, the more delay there is between something happening and it actually you know, um, showing the video from what actually happened. So we've got to keep all that in mind as well. If you really want speedy response, IP is not the way to do it. Um, HDSDI and analog gives you a much faster, immediate result. Okay, because there's less processing involved. Um, but check the details very carefully on our website. We generally put up, you know, the distances and you know, compatible stuff from there. Um, we can also test anything out here as well. So if your, you know, your customer needs a 300 meter run of something, let us know with plenty of time in hand and we'll get our technicians and our guys to run the test on it, make sure it works over the cable you need it to and then go from there. Okay? Cool. Um, if that's everything, you can come up and see me with any other questions afterwards, but thank you very much for your time this Thanks, morning. Ben. Have a fantastic weekend.